Welcome to the next instalment of the Foundations course, where we look at an aspect of theology, see how it all fits together, just to give us a bit of a framework for doing life, doing life as a Christian. We want to grow in God and in the grace of God. And if we understand some key principles, it will be such an, an assistance to us. So we've already looked at God is love. And that was the first piece of the jigsaw. And secondly, people are created in God's image. They, they are really foundational principles. There's a lot of other ones too that will give us, I guess, the corners of um, uh, uh, that jigsaw puzzle. So today I want us to look at God as judge. These are two, there are two aspects really to God's nature, his love and his being a judge. And so I want to read to you today from uh, Isaiah, the, chapter 33, verse 22. It says, For God is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. And I want to follow that up in uh, John chapter 5, verses 22 and just into 23. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. The idea of God as judge is really important, and it actually fits in really well with the second piece in the jigsaw puzzle, which is that people are made in God's image. You see, if we're made in God's image, we are created beings by God, and therefore we are under his guidelines as to how to live life. And it came out there a little bit that God is our king. And uh, many Bible commentators talk about um, our modern idea of king is very different from in the ancient world. God as king or Jesus as the king of kings is the one who is the ultimate judge. So a king, in, in ancient times particularly, because of his authority, could put in place and uphold the laws that he believed would bring flourishing to the people. Put in place and uphold laws that would lead to a flourishing of his population. Now, in upholding his law, the king is the ultimate judge. He may um, set aside a person or people to be judges. And what their role is, is basically to make sure that people are following his rules for flourishing. Um, so he embodies as the king, he is the ultimate, uh, the, the ultimate person who is able to demand compliance within his kingdom. So think about that. When we bow the knee in allegiance to Jesus, to God, we are actually saying, Lord, your moral framework is what I want in my life. When we talk about a moral framework, we're talking about two things. The first is values. Values are rooted in God's character. These are the things that we say are good or bad. Good or bad. The moral worth of something. They are values. And secondly, duties. These are rooted in God's commandments. They are the right and wrong. So we have the good and the bad. What's good? What's bad? And then we have our duties. What's right and wrong? What am I obliged to do? What are the things that I have to do? What are the things that I'm not to do as being part of his kingdom? So these two things make up the moral framework of God's kingdom and really are an establishment of how he judges humanity 
and how he judges the human heart. So <clears throat> what I want to ask is uh, about the implications. What, what are some implications from God being the ultimate judge? The first, I think, is that um, this aspect of God's character or his role doesn't uh, undermine that very first principle that God is love. Sometimes we think about God as judge as a negative thing. Would that be in your case? I've definitely felt that, that, oh, he's a judge. I just want him to be love. But as judge, when we have, we have to be reminded that his moral framework, and we can look at that in the Ten Commandments, we could look at that in the summary of those, love God with all that you are and love your neighbour as yourself. Everyone that you come in contact with, can you love them as you love yourself? That sort of is a summary of his moral framework. <clears throat> Just the fact that he has a moral framework, an expectation for us to live according to his rights and wrongs and his good and bad doesn't mean that he is not loving. In fact, if to the degree to which we comply with his moral framework is the degree to which we experience the flourishing that he wants because he loves people. I guess a, another thing to ponder is who are those in his kingdom? Who are those who are then under his judgment? Again, when I say under his judgment, I don't necessarily mean the 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 rod you know um i would say two things that god judges humanity you see every person every human being has been made in the image of god that was the second piece of the jigsaw puzzle therefore every human being is responsible in themselves to comply with his moral framework. If they don't comply with his moral framework, I believe that there is that process of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. If you come into alignment with his moral uh, good or bad and comply with his duties, this is right, this is wrong, there is an like an automatic flourishing that takes place in your heart. If you go your own way, there's an automatic undermining of life. I can hear people railing against God because of some issue in their life. But in fact, it's simply a process of sowing and reaping. So that's one aspect. I do think that God is proactive as well in judgment. And it is to do with humanity. He wants humanity to flourish. And so God can allow, if we look in the Old Testament, as I've been saying, I'm reading through Ezekiel, and I can see how God, because of his love for Israel, his desperate need for them, desire for them, I should say, to flourish, but they were going against his moral framework for such a long time. And he warned them through the prophets. Finally, he said, I'm bringing Babylon in. And Babylon is going to sort you out and take you away from your land. So, something in me, probably in you as well, as a human being, we assume that we are the top of the food chain. We can't imagine that God would allow something painful to come in just because we're not fulfilling his plan for life we're not accepting his moral framework but we forget that God is our creator he can do with humanity as he pleases and yes he is a God of love because he desires people to to nestle in his love and not go their own way <clears throat> so there are two things there 
sowing and reaping principle, and also God as a proactive who does step in and allow things to happen in order for to make us get to our knees. You see, when you're on your knees in allegiance to him, there's a flourishing. And we can willingly bow the knee or we can be forced to bow the knee. Sometimes circumstances come that actually bring us to our knees, not from our, our heart to desire, but from circumstances, devastating circumstances sometimes. And then sometimes it's hard to discern the love of God. <clears throat> After saying that humanity is a focus in God's judgment, both good and bad, nations that uh, adopt his moral framework flourish uh, over those that don't. But I think that there's also a very specific thing to do with uh, the church. Israel in the Old Testament the church in the New Testament, there's something about the household of God. And uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Peter says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? There's something about being ushered into God's community. It's not just a, a, a wonderfully comfortable thing. In a sense, there's obligations, God's duties. Uh, 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 we are obliged to be light in this world. And we are to be distinct. We're to be salt in this life. And I think there's something really powerful about being salt. If that community of faith waters down the gospel, waters down what it means to live the Christian life, waters down the sharing of the gospel. How can God's voice of love reach those that he loves in the world? And I think there are times when things happen as judgment, harsh things that come upon churches, the church generally, as God's way of saying, you've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. I think judgment is a little bit like that. It says, wake up and come back to me. Well, I pray that this little um, facet of the Foundations course opens up new realms of experience as you open the word of God. God loves you. He created you. And he is your judge. And that's a beautiful thing because we are in him. We are in Christ. And so the blessings of Christ flow upon us. The judge is able to discern that, that we are in him. I spoke on Sunday, um, on Resurrection Sunday, about how on the, the cross we had the love of God and the judgment of God, the justice of God combined. There's something beautiful about God's love and his justice. The justice of God for my sin poured out on Jesus. He took all of my sin, all of your sin upon himself. Because we are in Christ, his judgments are favourable to those who are in Christ. He stands as a judge against our enemies. How beautiful is that? God as judge, he steps in and he, he scatters our enemies. I'll leave that with you today. God bless.